I'm going to go ahead and just start, and if stragglers come in, they can come in. Um, but my name is Audrey. I'm the community pharmacy resident here at UVA. And today I will be talking to you guys about anemia with a focus on iron deficiency anemia. I have no disclosures. And the objectives for this presentation are to describe the impact and physical examination findings pertinent to anemia, to outline the basic diagnostic tests used in the anemia workup, distinguish between varying classifications of anemia, review treatment options for iron deficiency anemia in particular, and to design a patient-centered plan for management of iron deficiency anemia. Anemia is one of the most common hemato hematological disorders, um, but it's not distributed evenly throughout the world. Um, there's about 10 million people in the United States that are affected by anemia, but this is, there's a five-fold increase in underdeveloped areas of the world. Um, and in some areas of the world, there's actually a prevalence of about above 50% in children in underdeveloped areas. Um, and approximately 50% of people in the United States that are diagnosed with anemia are further classified as iron deficiency anemia. There, these are the most common causes of anemia, but our deficiency anemia is definitely the most common. Um, but there's also vitamin deficiency anemia. So this is deficiencies in vitamin B12 or folic acid, aplastic anemia, and this is when there's a failure um, of the bone marrow to make enough red blood cells. Um, hemolytic, hemolytic anemia, which is the destruction of red blood cells in the bloodstream or the spleen. Um, sickle cell anemia, this is an inherited disorder, and chronic uh, anemia of chronic disease, and this occurs in the setting of another illness that resolves if the underlying illness is treated. The clinical signs and symptoms really depend on the magnitude of anemia, um, but the most common are usually cold intolerance, fatigue, as well as shortness of breath. I want to quickly just review the red blood cell life cycle um, because in anemia, it's caused by a disruption in this cycle, and it can happen on multiple areas in this process. So starting at the kidneys, the kidneys um, detect these low oxygen levels in your circulation. This, this stimulates your kidneys to release EPO or erythropoietin. This EPO stimulates the erythropoietin process. Um, this process increases your red blood cell concentration, which increases the oxygen carrying capacity of, in the blood. And this serves as a negative feedback loop. It goes on, um, the red blood cells live in your circulation for about 120 days, where um, once they're aged and damaged, they're recycled back and destroyed by macro macrophages. Um, globin proteins from hemoglobin is broken down into amino acids, and they're also recycled into new proteins. The heme group from hemoglobin um, are broken down into iron and bilirubin. Iron is then cycled back into new hemoglobin, and then bilirubin is excreted via bile in, in the feces. And so anemia is the reduction in the hemoglobin concentration below the normal expected range. And it's a condition where there's a reduced oxygen capacity of blood that doesn't really meet the physical, physiological needs of an individual. And so it's really when the hemoglobin drops below the normal values. And so for non-pregnant women, um, that would be 12. For pregnant women, it would be 11. And then for men, it would be 13. And then it can be further classified based on the severity. When looking and classifying anemia, you really look at first the CBC and the differential. And then you can also look at the peripheral smear. Just quickly reviewing the components of a CBC, the red blood cells is the number of erythrocytes in one cubic millimeter of whole blood. Hemoglobin, this is the oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells. Hematocrit is the volume of these cells compared to the vo total volume of the cells in the plasma. The MCV, um, this is the average size of a red blood cell. The MCHC, this is the average volume of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And then MCHC is the average concentration of hemoglobin per unit volume of packed red blood cells. Looking at the peripheral smear, you can look at the size, shape, and the color of these red blood cells. So the size of a red blood cell, these are characterized by the MCV value, and they can, you can further classify these into microcytic, macrocytic, or normocytic. 
Um, the shape, these can be classified like sickle cell is what you see here, schizocytes or poikiocytes. And then color, they can either be hypochromatic or hyperchromatic. And this is usually characterized by the hemoglobin and the MCH values. Um, particularly in iron deficiency anemia, you'll see um, the red blood cells are microcytic and they're also hypochromic. The classification of anemia can also be described in physiological as well as morphological terms. Physiological, you can have impaired red blood cell production, excessive red blood cell destruction, and you can also have excessive blood loss. And then morphological is what we described before, macrocytic, microcytic, or normocytic. Looking at the physiological approach, um, first is impaired red blood cell production, so this is um, in situations like aplastic anemia, where there's a bone marrow failure, um, nutritional deficiency, iron deficiency anemia. For those that um, suffer excessive red blood destruction, that can be happen in a hemolysis, um, infection. This happens in your microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, such as TTP and HUS. And then for excessive blood loss, that can be due to trauma or surgery, and as well as um, chronic blood loss, usually due to GI lesions. And this is just a review before. Um, so when you look at your CBC and your peripheral smear, if your MCV is less than 80, that's when it's defined as microcytic. If it's 80 to 100, those are the normal values, so it'd be described as normocytic. And then MCV greater than 80 would be macrocytic. Focusing more on the microcytic anemia, um, when you've defined this, you can further go on to iron studies. And so iron is an essential component of hemoglobin. About 20 milligrams are needed daily for production of red blood cells and cellular metabolism. And when you think about it, the only step that is physiologically regulated in terms of in and out balance of total iron is iron absorption. Um, the, dietary, the daily dietary intake is about 1 to 2 milligrams, and the same amount is also lost daily. But since there isn't really a regulatory step that controls how much iron is lost or excreted, um, we need other sources that are needed for iron hemostasis. And this is recycling of uh, old and aged uh, erythrocytes, iron exchange, as well as um, iron stores. The hemoglobin molecule that consists of two primary portions, the heme and the globin. So each heme molecule consists of four heme structures, and they're all bound together by iron. So you can see that iron is really important in the formation of heme, and the deficiency in iron will lead to a decrease in information of hemoglobin. Common causes of iron deficiency anemia, um, blood loss, like we talked about before, traumatic hemorrhage, um, menorrhagia, pregnancy and delivery, frequent blood donation, as well as frequent blood testing, as well as occult bleeding. Um, reduction in iron absorption, so this can happen in patients with celiac disease, H. pylori infection, or bariatric surgery, as well as inadequate intake, which would, um, this is iron deficiency anemia due to nutritional deficiency. The two forms of dietary iron are heme and non-heme. So heme, um, this is in the ferrous iron state. This is the most easily absorbed form of heme. Um, and it comes from animal food sources, such as meat, poultry, and seafood. And then your non-heme, this is your ferric iron. And these are found mainly in your plant-based foods, so green leafy vegetables, cacao, and dried fruit. So those who eat meat, they're getting their iron for both heme and non-heme sources, so you can imagine those that are on vegetarian diets are usually more likely to develop iron deficiency anemia. In looking at indicators of iron status, you can look at the serum ferritin, transferrin saturation, hepcidin, as well as the bone marrow aspiration. I'm not going to go too much into the bone marrow aspiration, but I wanted to mention that is, it is the gold standard for looking at iron stores, but it's because it's not really affected by things like inflammation, and it's also very highly specific, but it's also very invasive and very expensive, so we don't really do it. Um, we really look more at the serum ferritin and TSATs. So ferritin is a universal intracellular protein that stores and releases iron. And it's important because free iron acts as a catalyst um, in the formation of free radicals. And it can be toxic in cells at in excess amounts. 
And so ferritin is really used as an indirect marker of the total amount of iron stored in the body. The normal range is anywhere between 5 and 200 micrograms per liter, um, but the limitations is that concentrations are increased in acute and chronic inflammation. Um, it's also increased in malignant disease as well as liver disease. Transferrin is an iron binding plasma glycoprotein that's responsible for controlling the amount of iron and the amount of free iron. The normal range for transferrin is about 200 to 340. And then as for transferrin saturation, when you have a reduced serum iron concentration, you actually increase your iron binding capacity, which is why you're, you have a reduced transferrin saturation. The limitation of this is that it's decreased in inflammatory conditions. And hepcidin is one of the more recently discovered biomarkers. It's a peptide that's mainly secreted by hepatocytes, and it's a small peptide. Um, it's involved in iron hemostasis. So the main role of hepcidin is to control the surface expression of FPN. This is also known as a ferroportin. It's an iron exporting protein. So when um, hepcidin binds to the cell, uh, or ferroportin, it causes the internalization of this um, complex, and then it's degraded inside the cell. And so after ferroportin is degraded, macrophages and hepatocytes can no longer export iron. Looking into management of iron deficiency anemia, the goal is to really normalize your hemoglobin and replete your iron stores. Um, you can take two approaches to this, a food-based approach or a pharmacologic approach. Um, looking at a food-based approach, you can increase your consumption of iron-rich foods, such as the meat from poultry, cattle, um, and fish. You can increase your intake of legumes and green leafy vegetables. You can also increase the bioavailability of iron by providing an acidic environment for absorption. This is why we commonly tell patients to take it with a glass of orange juice or to take it with vitamin C. Or you can reduce inhibitors of iron absorption, such as calcium, um, tannins, and H2 blockers and PPIs. And pharmacologic approach, obviously, we will turn to oral, oral iron and IV iron supplements. These are the options that we have when we look at oral iron supplementation. Um, the most common is ferrous sulfate. Um, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Ferrous sulfate, it's inexpensive and it's widely available, but it does have GI symptoms associated with mainly constipation. Ferrous gluconate, it does have a lower risk of GI intolerance, but it does have the lowest amount of elemental iron. And then ferrous fumarate, it has the highest proportion of elemental iron, but it is very expensive at about $20 a bottle. And then when we're looking into oral iron, there's a couple of things that um, have been looked at. So whether daily or every other day administration is as, as effective or once daily or divided doses. So the study by Stoffel and, and Associates, they looked at a daily or alternate daily dosing regimen to um, determine whether or not iron absorption was increased in these individuals. So they looked, the first arm had 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate daily for 14 days, and then the other group had 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate every other day for 28 days. And they found that iron absorption was, also, was higher in those that had alternate daily dosing, 16.3% um, and 21.8% respectively. And there was about a 40 milligram difference in the iron absorption in those groups. They also found that GI side effects was increased in those patients that were taking iron supplementa supplementation daily. And so um, the, the conclusions of this, this portion of the study was that alternate daily dosing actually increases the absorption of iron. The same group also looked at daily or twice daily dosing, and this was a crossover design. So patients were first given 120 milligrams of ferrous sulfate daily for three days. They were given a 14-day crossover period, and then they were given 60 milligrams of ferrous sulfate twice daily for three days. They, also, they found that um, in both dosing regimens, there wasn't really a significant effect on iron absorption. 
And then uh, GI side effects were also fairly similar between the two groups as well. So they conclude that the common practice of splitting an oral iron dose um, in an attempt to increase iron absorption is unnecessary, and the divided dosing does not significantly really affect fractional or the total absorption of iron. So this leads to our first question. Uh, your patient's about to start on oral iron supplements. What would be the most simple regimen that would result in the best iron absorption? Um, would you give them ferrous sulfate two tablets every other day, ferrous sulfate two tablets in divided doses every other day, two tablets as one dose daily, or two tablets as one dose, or two tablets daily in divided doses? Do I hear A? <laughs> um, so based on the studies, um, before, it would be appropriate to give them two tablets as one dose every other day. Looking at our options for IV iron supplementations, um, these products really differ with respect to the underlying conditions that led to um, the FDA approval indications. So iron dextran, um, it's indicated an iron deficiency for which oral replacement is inadequate. Ferric gluconate, these are indicated in patients with chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis um, on ESA therapy. Iron sucrose is indicated for patients with CKD on he with hemodialysis um, with or without ESA. And then ferroheme is indicated for patients with chronic kidney disease. There are some kind of considerations when thinking about which ones to choose for your patient. So for iron dextran, you can administer all your iron supplementation as one dose, whereas um, ferrous gluconate and iron sucrose, they have to be administered over multiple appointments. And then um, ferroheme is the most expensive product. And so if you noticed before, um, with iron dextran, there is a black box warning for anaphylaxis. So Wang and Associates, they wanted to look further into this. So they looked at I IV iron dextran and non-dextran IV products. And they actually found that the risk for anaphylaxis at first <coughs> exposure is triple for iron dextran than all of the other non-dextran IV products. And you can see here that the use of iron dextrans has decreased a lot over time, while non-dextran IV products have actually increased, um, particularly for ferroheme and iron sucrose. And um, you can see the rapid increase in the use of ferroheme after its FDA approval in 2009. The FDA has also just recently approved a supplemental new drug application for ferroheme um, to extend its use beyond its indicated use of in chronic kidney disease to actually all patients that have iron deficiency anemia. And then when using IV iron, you definitely want to monitor for iron overload or toxicity. So you want to monitor their LFTs, you want to monitor their serum ferritin and um, consider interrupting therapy if it exceeds 800 and transfer and saturation above 50%. You also want to monitor the iron levels after 48 hours after administration, and then also monitor the hemoglobin hematocrit weekly. And so thinking about when to use IV iron, um, it really depends on the magnitude of iron deficiency. So in those that have a uh, hemoglobin less than 10, you want to consider using IV iron first. Um, with those that with a hemoglobin greater than 10, you might want to try oral iron first and only if they have intolerance or no response um, to then go to IV iron. And then also for those, you want to consider those with malabsorption, so those with H. pylori infection or Celex disease, you may want to also go to IV iron therapy first. So this comes to our second question. In which patient would you consider using IV iron treatment? Um, a patient with Celex disease, a patient with hemoglobin less than 10, or a patient who cannot tolerate oral iron? Great, all of the above. Um, so, as you can see here, anemia is quite common at varying degrees in patients with chronic kidney disease, but it becomes a lot more common with more advanced stages, and in particular at stages four and five. 
And so those with chronic kidney disease have marked alterations in iron balance and tissue distribution. Um, and those, particularly with those on hemodialysis, they commonly suffer from iron losses from the process of hemodialysis itself. Um, they also can uh, suffer from um, suppress erythropoietin, reduce iron absorption, um, and then impaired mobilization of iron from iron stores. And so since, um, since patients with chronic kidneys, they, they exist in a pro-inflammatory state chronically, and so decision to start IV th iron becomes a little more complicated in these patients. Um, the pro-inflammatory state inhibits the mobilization of iron, and ferritin can reach very, very high levels. And so it's not uncommon to see patients with a ferritin greater than 200 um, when, in those with chronic kidney disease. So you really want to be careful when interpreting these lab values for them. So if their ferritin is less than 200, it's, um, you can safely infer that it's probably from iron deficiency, and you can consider using IV, or iron supplementation. When the ferritin is between 200 and 800, it may be, um, it may be associated with a decrease in iron, but you can also consider inflammation as well for an increased ferritin. When um, the ferritin level is between 800 and 1200, it's most commonly associated with inflammation or infection. So you, want, you definitely want to consider those before starting IV iron therapy. And in those with a ferritin greater than 1200, um, that is usually an indication of iron overload and you should definitely avoid iron in those instances. And so treatment of anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease really requires an evaluation of potential causes. And so while patients with chronic kidney disease commonly have both iron deficiency, they also have erythropoietin deficiency. So we've already discussed how to use um, IV iron and oral iron in these patients, but now we're going to talk about using ESAs or erythropoietin stimulating agents in this population. And so ESAs, these stimulate the precursors to red blood cell productions. They allow these precursor cells to develop and proliferate and differ differentiate into reticulocytes that are then released into the circulation for development into mature red blood cells. Um, the process of red blood cell generation and creation requires iron. And so whenever you are using ESAs, you still want to make sure you're supplementing their iron. The two agents that we have are epigen and aranefs, um, and so these are the dosings for those on and not on hemodialysis. And um, regarding dose adjustments, so you want to give a, um, enough time for the erythropoietic process to take place and for red blood cell production to try and balance against the loss of red blood cell loss. Um, so it's generally recommended that there is about a four-week interval between dose adjustments in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease and anemia. And so considerations for initiation of ESAs. In adult patients with chronic kidney disease that are not on hemodialysis yet, unless the hemoglobin is less than 10, ESA therapy shouldn't be initiated. But those that um, have CKD not on hemodialysis yet, but their hemoglobin is less than 10, the decision to start ESA should be individualized and consider potential risk and benefits. In patients with chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis, um, ESA therapy should be used to avoid hemoglobin falling below 9. And in general, ESA therapy shouldn't really be used to maintain a hemoglo hemoglobin level greater than 11.5. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And then finally, you want to also evaluate their iron status prior to initiating ESA therapy. So question three, your team decides to start ESA therapy for your patient who has CKD that's on hemodialysis because their hemoglobin has dropped below nine. What treatment option would be the best for your patient? Would it be epigen, 50 units per kilogram uh, three times weekly, Aranesp? Um, weekly ARNFs every four weeks, or would you want to evaluate the iron status prior to initiating it? Good. And so this was one of the first landmark trials that looked at 
um, optimal hemoglobin or optimal hematocrit levels for this particular population. And so this was the U.S. normal hematocrit trial, and they wanted to look at what is the benefit of ESA in patients with CKD that are on hemodialysis. They gave, um, they divided into two groups. The first group got doses of epoetin to achieve and maintain a hematocrit of 42%. The other group got doses of epoetin sufficient to maintain a hematocrit of 30% throughout the study. And the primary endpoint that they looked at was the length of time to death or to the first non-fatal MI. And the trial was stopped early because the intervention being tested actually caused harm. Um, there was actually no difference between groups for the primary outcome, but there was a 39% of um, patients in the first group who had vascular clotting, and then 29% in the control arm that also experienced that same event. So the next study that wanted to look at optimal hemoglobin levels for this particular population was the CHOIR study. So this is the correction of hemoglobin and outcomes in renal insufficiency. And they wanted to look at the optimal level of hemoglobin concentration in uh, patients with CKD not on hemodialysis. And so the first group got epoetin alpha to target a hemoglobin level of 13.5, and the next group got epoetin alpha to target a hemoglobin level of 11.3. And they looked at the composite of death, MI, hospitalization for heart failure, and stroke. And they actually, this was also terminated early due to lack of evidence of cardiovascular benefit, but they did find that more events occurred in the high hemoglobin arm compared to the lower hemoglobin arm. I wanted to point out that target hemoglobin levels, they weren't achieved in the high hemoglobin group. The highest hemoglobin achieved was 12.6, and this was even with higher doses of epoetin. And this suggests that patients actually might be at risk for adverse events even at a less than fully corrected hemoglobin level. But they did find that there were improvements of quality of life, or they found that the quality of life was similar between these two groups. The next study um, was the CREATE study, and so this is cardiovascular reduction and early anemia treatment with epoetin beta, and they wanted to see does early correction of anemia provide a better cardiovascular protection in patients, not uh, CKD patients, not on hemodialysis. And so they wanted to look at this particularly because there are a lot of studies that have highlighted that there is a relationship between CKD and then mortality because its impact on cardiac function um, that leads to the development of left ventricular hypertrophy. And so their primary and secondary endpoint was looking at the change from baseline, um, the LV mass index within one year, and then the time to cardi first cardiovascular event, as well as CKD production. So they found no significant difference between the two groups in the likelihood of a first cardiovascular event, but they did see a, a, a statistically significant benefit in quality of life. So the goal of this study was to show a superiority of full anemia correction in terms of cardiovascular events um, as compared to partial correction of anemia. And while there wasn't really a significant difference between the groups in the likelihood, of a first cardiovascular event, there actually was, a, they did find improvements in quality of life. So previous studies like the CREATE and the CHOIR trial, they suggested that the impact of anemic correction might not, might not be as favorable. Um, and then TREAT was the first study that actually used a placebo. And so this is the trial of Jarbopoietin alpha in type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And they wanted to see what is the benefit and efficacy of ESA in a population of patients with CKD not on hemodialysis. The first arm had darbopoietin alpha to achieve a hemoglobin of 13, and then the placebo arm, um, they only had rescued darbopoietin when their hemoglobin dropped below 9. And then they looked at the composite outcomes of death, cardiovascular event, or end-stage renal disease. So the results of this study that there wasn't really a difference in risk of primary endpoint, but they actually did find that there was an increased risk of stroke and the number needed to harm was actually only 40. And so actually after this study came out, the prescribing of erythropoiesis stimulating agents actually reduced by 35%.
And so looking at um, these landmark trials, you can see in about three, three of the four studies didn't reach their target hemoglobin, but in three out of the four studies, they actually found that um, targeting higher hemoglobin levels actually caused harm in these patients. Um, and there wasn't really a conclusion on whether or not these improved quality of life in the end. And so question four, a physician in your clinic heard that you recently attended a presentation that reviewed literature regarding optimal hemoglobin targets in patients with CKD and anemia. Um, she approaches you and asks you for a general rule of thumb that she can apply to her patients. What human tar hemoglobin target would you recommend? A normalized hemoglobin value of greater than 13, hemoglobin between 10 and 11, hemoglobin between 9 and 10, or that hemoglobin levels should be individualized to each patient and take into consideration risk versus benefit and the patient-specific risk factors. So hemoglobin should really be individualized. And it's one of the conclusions that, looking at all these landmark trials, that there really isn't, there are challenges in determining a goal hemoglobin level, and you really should take into account if a patient has malignancy or if they had a history of stroke, then ESA therapy should really be used with caution in these types of patients. And so from these trials, we can conclude that there are challenges in determining an optimal hemoglobin target in patients with chronic kidney disease, and it's really difficult to definitively specify a target level based on the available literature. But there is strong literature to suggest that targeting a, hem a normalized hemoglobin level of greater than 13 is associated with increased risk of adverse events, and that individualized hemoglobin levels should be achieved that minimize the need for blood transfusions and reduce anemia-related symptoms. Looking at the proposed mechanisms of these adverse um, events, so when you administer erythropoietin stimulant agents, you have an increase um, EPO, which this also increases your hematocrit, which also increases your blood viscosity. So this can lead to increases in your blood pressure, as well as increase your risk of clotting. There actually is also found to have there between epoetin and thrombopoietin, there is a, a homology between these two um, proteins. So it's about there's a 20% identity and then a 25% similarity. Um, they did look at rat studies where rats were injected with um, 10, 50, and 150 units of recombinant. Um, EPO, and they actually found that the platelets in these rats actually increased in those higher, um, those higher concentrations. And so when you're thinking about optimal management of anemia, you definitely want to strike a balance between patient-specific risk factors, the use of ESAs, and the use of iron. So you want to evaluate patient-specific risk factors, use the lowest possible dose of ESA, um, you want to replete iron if necessary prior to initiating ESA, and you want to consider the benefit versus harm when choosing between IV and oral iron supplementation. And so in summary, iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia. The goal of managing iron deficiency anemia is to normalize hemoglobin levels, replete iron stores, and minimize the need for blood transfusions. Specified Hemoglobin targets cannot really be determined based on the available literature that we have, and then treatment of iron deficiency anemia should really be individualized to the particular patient. And with that, I'll take any questions that you guys have. Sure. Right. So I didn't look particularly into ideal body weight, um, but I do know that there isn't really an FDA label for a max dose, just that um, when in some of those studies where they did find that uh, they were using ESAs, and for those that are targeting the higher hemoglobin levels, they did, those ESA doses were almost double. Um, and so when you're thinking about that, you should really think about the overutilization of ESAs and the costs associated with that.
but as far as ideal body weight, I didn't really look into that. Thank you so much.